Hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to share this word with you. Oh my goodness. The message from Gospel Revolution Church on Sunday was just totally over the top. I listened to it twice yesterday. I listened to it today. I plan on listening to it every day and uh, while I, I'm on my Bowflex. And you know, it really makes me look forward to getting on there uh, so I can listen to Greg. Oh my goodness, that was so chock full. And you know, even today I got more out of it than I did uh, listening to it twice yesterday. It's just such a word that is just so wonderful. And uh, oh my goodness, my heart is chock full. I've got so much to say, but you know what? I'm just gonna give you um, the first part of what I got out of it. First of all, when Greg was talking about um, Paul and how in the, um, 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about having a thorn in the flesh that he sought the Lord three times to get rid of this thing. And you know, over the years, I've heard so many things about that thorn in his flesh and how God gave it to him. And you know, right there, it says it was a messenger from Satan. It didn't come from God. It came from the enemy, okay? And he wanted the Lord to take care of it. And he said unto me, he said, uh, for this thing I sought the Lord thrice, three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Just look at that, okay? I mean, Paul was so anxious and so sick of this thing. And you know, I definitely believe that this messenger of Satan was no more than Judaizers or a Judaizer, one that followed Paul wherever he went. And Paul um, preached the good news and people got saved. And this guy or them, whatever, would come right behind him and try and undo what Paul had done getting them back to believe in the law. And I can understand how frustrating it was to him. But you know what? God spoke a word to Paul that totally changed Paul's perspective. Okay? That which he absolutely hated, all of a sudden he's embracing and he's found a newborn strength in him that he didn't know he had. And you know, really, God was doing in Paul what was written in the Old Testament that was prophesied that would come. In Joel 3.10, it says, let the weak say, I am strong. Well, you know what, back then, you know, they didn't know. How is the weak going to say, I'm strong? Only through the revelation of Jesus Christ and his indwelling spirit can this be. Amen? You know, the thing is, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture, now you've got to understand something. Paul got a word that totally revolutionized his life and caused him to look at tribulation and persecution in a totally different light. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know, it's not saying it's going to tell you how to live your life. It's going to tell you how one becomes righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. That the man of God, 
may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, my the, the word gives me the ability, it, it, it furnishes me with everything I need for good works. Well, you know, there again, the carnal mind will go, well, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And that's not what it's talking about. Remember in John 6, 28, the scripture says, Then said they unto Jesus, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's the work of God, to believe. And the thing is, even that, it says this is the work of God that you believe. Listen, it's God that's going to persuade you to believe what he believes. Boy, I'll tell you something. This thing is so simple. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, when I was thinking of, um, uh, when I was thinking about Paul, this just came into me. Paul was a pioneer. And you know, it came into me, bam, like that. And is all I could think of was Joshua. Remember in Joshua 3, it says, Joshua rose up early in the morning and they removed from Shechem and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. Okay? So they were on this side of Jordan. And it came to pass after three days. You know, whenever I see three days, that a bell goes off. Resurrection, resurrection. And uh, it's just like when uh, Abraham went up the mount to sacrifice his son Isaac. It says he went a three days journey. Okay? This is a picture of the resurrection. And it says, after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. You know, the ark of the covenant represented the presence of God. Well, you know, that was all a picture and a type. Jesus is the true ark. Amen. And uh, he, he goes on to say in the latter part of verse 4, that ye may know the way. Stay close to the ark, okay? You know, when you see it moving, you go right after it. Oh, okay, that reminds me of the scripture in Revelation uh, that says, these are they that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Amen? So it's a picture of Jesus. That you may know the way by which ye must go, for you have not passed this way hitherto before. He's saying, you know, you're going to, I mean, let's face it, they've been going around in circles in the wilderness for 40 years, and now they're going into new territory, and they don't know the way, so stick close to the ark. And you know something? Paul was a trailblazer. I mean, Paul was the one that received the revelation of grace that was saved uh, through faith, uh, by grace through faith. This was the gospel that was revealed to the apostle Paul. Nobody had experienced this before. And now we have Paul writing, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and we have all the revelation that he received from the Lord at our fingertips. So, you know, uh, I want to avail myself of this, amen? You know, uh, in, in John 14, 26, Jesus said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. 
whatsoever I have said unto you. So, you know, the Holy Spirit will bring back the word that Jesus has spoken. And Jesus spoke this word to Paul and to Peter and uh, all of the uh, New Testament scriptures. And so, as I was listening, I mean, Greg is so phenomenal because he will preach and it's like fire down a tube, baby. <laughs> I mean, he just goes a mile a minute. That's why you need to listen to it over and over again because there is so much good stuff crammed into his messages. And as I was listening to him on Sunday, he went into a discourse, not saying chapter or verse. He wasn't quoting scripture. He was just speaking from his heart. But all he was saying was scripture, one after another, after another, linking it all together like a beautiful chain. His heart is full of the word. And he's so free that he doesn't feel, you listen, I was in legalism for so many years that I feel like if, when I say the word, I've got to quote chapter and verse, and that really hangs me up. I wish I had the freedom that Greg has found just to spew it out and just, it was just so beautiful. But usually, when the Lord says anything to me, it's the word. He speaks to me through his word. And Listen to this in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Grace, the divine influence of God upon the heart, reflected in the life, and his peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, what he's saying is, the more you come to know him, the more you come to know the Father and the Son, the more your heart is going to be at rest because you are going to come to know the one that loves you and is on your side and he will tax the farthest star to meet your needs. When you know the character of God, God, oh my goodness, it is just wonderful. According as his divine power, his divine power, the Holy Spirit, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You know, I mean, whenever, you know, I, I feel like I lack, this scripture comes to my heart. He's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So what's the problem here? I don't have a problem. As that word boils up in my heart, it's like, okay, Lord, you got me covered. Okay? But the scripture says, His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So all of this comes through coming to know him. And we come to know him through his word and his promises. It says, whereby, because of this, because we, um, we, that we, uh, that he's given us all things that pertain unto life of godliness through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue, for this reason, he's given us these great and exceeding precious promises that by these you might be partakers of his divine nature. In other words, listen, I've given you these promises that you can sink your teeth into them and actually see the fruit of his life being manifest in your body. When you come to know what you've got and what, when you come to know him and how he's given us all things freely, it says, having escaped the corruption 
that is in the world through lust. How would we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? Because we know that we have eternal life and now I have escaped the rat race out there that is trying to obtain life through what they do. It's the lust for life. Nobody wants to die. And so they're trying with everything they got to get life. But I've, I've been delivered from that rat race because he's given me his life freely. I didn't do anything. He's the one that convinced me it was available. And I just said, yeah, man, that's good. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. Philemon 6. That the communication of thy faith. Now that word communication is koinonia. It's the same word as communion or fellowship. Okay? To communicate in your joint participation, participation, the share which one has in anything. You know, I get to share my, to, my participation in the good news with people. Okay? It says the communication of thy faith, okay, may become effectual or powerful by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How are you going to know what is in you if you don't read the precious promises? I mean, you know what? A person can do whatever they want. I mean, you don't ever have to pick up your Bible. You don't. But I'll tell you what. The, the word informs me of what is mine. And when I find out that this is promised to me by God, I'm going to grab a hold of it and make use of the promises that he's given unto me. Amen. I don't want to find out that I could have had something going on and I didn't. Because I never knew the promise was there for me to have it. And you know, I mean, it's not just reading your Bible. It's listening to people like Greg and Bodie that really have it going on in their life. As I was reading this definition of koinonia, is all I could think of is the righteous are as bold as a lion. Because Philemon is saying, listen, your faith will become emboldened, empowered when you, when you acknowledge, when you come to know everything that you've got going on on the inside of you, honey. And then it said, then I hear the righteous or those that are as they should be, which is in Christ, are as bold as a lion. Now that's scripture. And as I thought that, the thought came, and who is the lion? And then I said, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's scripture. And then, as he is, so are we in this world. That's scripture. But all of that came come to my heart just looking at the definition of uh Communicate. Listen, listen to this. I mean, let me tell you something. It is no secret. I absolutely love the Word of God. Amen. Because it's um, it's uh, Jesus's uh, last will and testament. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus, and the Scripture tells me what I inherited in Christ. Don't you think I want to know? I mean, listen, if somebody died and left you a will, wouldn't you want to read it and find out what, what's yours? I surely would, amen. Well, look at this. In John 15, Jesus said, I'm the vine, and my father is the husbandman. He is the one that takes care of the vineyard. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, 
That word taketh away means to uh, lift up or to carry, okay? So if, if you're really in poor shape, he'll carry you. Amen. It says, in every branch that bears fruit, he purgeth it that it might bring forth more fruit. He purgeth it. What does that word mean, purgeth? It means cleanses it. And then Jesus said, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That word purge and that word clean is the same. So you could say it like this. Every branch that beareth fruit, he cleanseth it that it might bring forth much more fruit. Well, how does he cleanse it? How does he cleanse us? Jesus said it. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So the Father cleanses us of the wrong belief through his word. You know, the scripture says in Ephesians 5 that um, Jesus is going to present us as a, a bride without spot or wrinkle uh, through the washing of the word. So the word washes out our wrong beliefs. But you know, let me tell you something. If you're not established in grace, reading the word, if your mind has not been um, transformed from the carnal way of thinking to see through the mind of Christ, to read the word, uh, you could be reading it through the lens of Moses and get yourself in a mess, you know? So it's good to listen to sound teaching. Amen. Um, where am I? Okay, so Jesus goes on to say, Abide in me and I in you. Okay, you got to abide in Jesus and him in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. Listen, if we're not abiding in Christ, if we're not abiding in Christ's reality and what he's done for us, we ain't going to bring forth squat. Okay. He says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And you know, uh, the psalmist David said in 119.11, Thy word. Now, if you read this in the Greek Septuagint, you'll see that thy word is not Torah. It's Logos. Okay? So, you see, David, David trusted God. Okay? He put his trust in God. David had faith in the goodness of God. And he says, I have hid thy logos, which is the word, like in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh, and we know him as Jesus. Well, David hid the logos, or the logic of God, in his heart, that I might not sin against thee. And, you know, he's not talking about going out and doing something wrong. He's talking about, if I have God's logic in my heart, God's way of thinking, seeing, seeing the way God thinks about me in my heart, then I'm not going to go out there and try to attain unto a works righteousness because I'm trusting in God for my salvation. Amen. And the last scripture I want to uh, read to you. You know, so many times we hear the same scriptures, okay? And we don't hear some of the scriptures. And um, it's all very important, amen? And this one is in Hebrews 6, 11 through 20. The author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, said this. And we desire every one of you 
do show the same diligence. You know, Greg talked about this a few weeks ago about diligence. You know, the hand of the diligent maketh fat, you know? I mean, that's the way it is in the world. If you want to get ahead, you got to put your hand to the plow and go uh, plow and go for it. But you know, this is talking about the things of of God. It says we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful. You know, the hand of the slothful maketh poor. You know, I mean, these are spiritual analogies. The hand of the diligent makes fat. The hand of the slothful brings poverty. Okay, and so it's it's saying, you know, we want to get it all, man. I want to believe everything that God has for me, that I can see the manifestation of that in my life. Amen. I don't, listen, I, you know, I love the word, okay, and I love to hear good preaching. It is not a labor for me to sit and listen to good news. Okay, now it would be a labor if I was listening to some bad news, but this, this just causes my ears to perk up and I want to hear more, give me more, feed me, see more, feed me. And uh, it says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What is this saying? It's saying, you know, listen to those that you can see uh, have inherited the promise. You know, I see, I see the fruit of the Spirit in Greg's life, you know, especially on Wednesday night. You know, he is so patient and he is so kind. And that man is so full of the love of Jesus Christ. You know, he's just so beautiful. Amen. So I love to listen to him. Okay? So it says, you know, hook yourself up to somebody that you can see the life of God um, being uh, manifested in their life. Because you know what? Hey, if you see that he's got it going on, then you know what? He's, he's got the secret. He knows. So listen to what he's got to say. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. But you know what? He had a promise. And he grabbed a hold of that thing and said, you know what? I am going to wait and see this sucker come to pass. But you know, you got to have a promise to hold on to. It says, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. I mean, you know what? Once you've given me your word, that's it. There's no more, there's no more worrying about it. And the thing is, it says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. So this wasn't just for Abraham. This was for us. Because we are heirs. We are children of Abraham through Christ, by faith. It says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. That word immutability is fixed and unalterable. There isn't even a shadow of turning in God. If he said it, he will do it. And not only so, he gave a promise, okay? It says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. 
You know, just like Greg said uh, on Sunday, how he promises um, Becky, you know, that he won't say anything. You know, that causes her heart to go to rest and say, Phew, wow, okay, I got his word on it. Amen. Well, that's what God wanted to do for us. He wanted us to have strong consolation. That word consolation is comfort and refreshment. You know, every time we see the promises of God, it should cause our heart to just skip a beat and be refreshed and like, wow, this is great. Hallelujah. Okay, so he wanted to give a strong consolation to those who have fled for refuge. And you know, when I read that, fled for refuge, Jesus is our refuge. And you know, in the Old Testament, I think there was seven cities of refuge, okay? And this was a picture and, uh, and type of Christ because when somebody had uh, been a manslayer, killed somebody by accident or something, they could run to that city of refuge and um, the, the person, family members, couldn't come in and kill them because they were protected. And, um, you know, the magistrates of that city would go out and clear the way to make sure there wasn't any trees in the way that ob would ob obstruct that one fleeing for refuge. And, you know, I've always seen that as a minister, um, we want to clear the way and make a nice clean path for people who don't know Jesus to come fleeing in to that refuge, which is Christ, uh, to seek safety. And you know what? The enemy has thrown all kind of obstacles in the way and all of these obstacles come through accusation. You're not good enough. You did this. You did that. You know, he is the accuser of the brethren. And um, unfortunately, he's getting a lot of help in a lot of pulpits because they're pointing the finger also. And it just doesn't make you feel like you can run to Jesus. It's like he doesn't want you. You've got to, you've got to fix yourself up. And that is all lies. So God promised so he could give us strong <clears throat> consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul that word anchor is a stay or a safeguard both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Glory to God. He's saying, come on in. The way is free. I've, I've prepared a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. Come on in with me and have this glorious fellowship. We will have the time of your life. Even Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I'd like to share with you how Jesus um, stood on the word. And um, it gave him strong consolation through all that he went through. But I've said enough, and um, I really hope that this word has encouraged you. Um, you just have a wonderful evening and uh, listen to Greg's message from Sunday. It'll blow your doors open. Okay, love. Good night.